thank you everyone for coming today. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to Paul's family. It means a lot to Paul. You know, it hasn't been an easy time for, for any of us. Even though Paul's not going to be here physically anymore, everything left behind is still watching us every day. No matter what we do, all the memories of love that you might be shared together will always be in our hearts, always be in our minds. Always be here. And the constant reminders we see of them on a daily basis are beautiful, cherished, something we'll never forget, something we'll hold on to forever. We're going to start by passing out uh, cards to everyone. You can share a memory, something funny, something sweet. Anything you're hearts and desires. Always very intellectual. We'd have some deep conversations, some playful conversations. You know, he's going to be missed by many. He's loved by many in this room and plenty more out there. It's a sad tragedy, you know. The thing I think I remember the most about him was just his genuineness and the warmth and kindness of his spirit. Like every time you came in contact with him, like you really experienced that. And uh, even though it was short, it was a pleasure to get to know Paul was just serious about animals, especially cats. Um, and we have this old cat that hangs out at one of our houses. Polly B was tasked with uh, getting rid of Max. Um, Max still lives with us. <laughs> He's fat and happy and he's really well fed and I think Max will be around until he goes to join Paul one day. His investment in each person was, it was impressive. And I think it speaks volumes to how he came up, it speaks volumes to his compassion and his kindness and how much he cares for people. So, you know, we lost, we lost a good one. and. Uh, I'm glad we're able to kind of carry on his fight in that in that respect. And I'm also very happy that the cat will be safe. <laughs> I just remember, remember his smile and just the genuineness and his compassion. I last saw him when he stopped him to visit, I guess it was a little over a month ago, and he's sitting right on the couch over there. And he walked up, and he's like, how are you doing? And he asked me how I was doing. And it was like I could really feel like he actually cared. You know, it wasn't just to say, hey, how are you doing? So that's what I remember most about Paul, you know, his compassion and his love. Mm -hmm. but, um, he was always just a very kind and gentle person, and always took an interest in, in my life and in everyone else's life. And he, was, he was a really good guy, so I'm glad I got to meet him. One of those guys that you, when you saw him, you, you, you felt, um, when I knew he was coming off the ship or something like that, I knew it was going to be a good ship. I knew Paul was here. We love the clients. I'll always love him. I, I will. I truly will. I, I felt a little resentment towards it, but now I can honestly say that, you know, I, I will always love Paul. With, with all my heart and soul. Um, there were a lot of opportunities for him to give me advice. Um, but the best part about it was after the advice, I always seemed to somehow put it in a way where I looked at it differently when I walked away. Um, you know, he took me outside the tunnel and I was able to see a more broad picture or a different side of something. I'll miss Paul. I really will. Um, he was a very amazing soul, and I think that he saved a lot of lives that he doesn't know about. Um, he taught me a lot. He was very special. Uh, Judy, Paul's mom. It's gonna be really hard, but I want to say something. So I've known him since July 16th, 1986, the day he was born. 
um, I love hearing everything from everyone today. And the, uh, the viewing yesterday, it's helped, it's helped us so much. Um, I guess, you know, I love the descriptions of Paul as a gentle giant and an old soul. And I think both of those things he was. His sister, who can't be here today because she has a new baby, said in uh, the Facebook post that he had an enormous and tender heart. And I, I think that really says it all. He was just a sweet, funny guy. And... Uh, as, it, as I said, it's been such an enormous help to us to learn more about all the help that he's given to everyone over the years. Um, and we, we will just remember all of that. And I will say that while chicken nuggets and macaroni, craft macaroni and cheese, craft <laughs> were always his favorite foods as a child. We did actually eat other foods. <laughs> <laughs> and we attempted for many years to eat other foods. He recently, you know, a few months ago, would text me and show me photos of meals that he had cooked that included no Kraft mac macaroni and cheese, no fast food, the grilled chicken, and broccoli. <laughs> so we finally ate a vegetable. <laughs> um, just thank you all so much. In the hearts of our hearts. <clears throat> when Bob falls dead, wow, it's amazing hearing all these stories. Uh, Paul came down here in 2008. I brought him down. Uh, a lot of stuff going on up in New York. And finally, we were going back and forth one night and had to sign a release to agree to come into a treatment of you know, life skills of Boca Ritan. I don't know how I did it. So I, mean, I, I wore him down and should be done to bed. So I said, all right, I'll sign it. Okay. So, you know. Dogs count, so we flew down Fort Lauderdale, rented a car, drove up to uh, up this way. Just took A1A all the way. I don't know, I don't see it. And he just on the plane. He just he was just kind of looking at nothing. Looked at nothing out the window, and we got here. And uh, you know, I don't know what he thought was going to happen when he. You know, guy, we said something like it was one of these like 90 day things. And so I figured it might be longer. I said, well, Paul, it's not just one of these 90 days and you're out of here kind of deals. But she took him in, meaning he was going to be in it for about 30 days and out of here. You know, no, no, no. And we came down for a family weekend thing and uh, started off really good. You know, you see kind of, you know, they get them all jazzed up and everything. And then uh, a lot of stuff happened. Anyway, it became clear that it was not just going to be, you know, back up in New York. Uh, and it kind of deteriorated and we got all pissed off. And so, anyway, we had to go back. And then Christmas Day or something like that, Paul saw He told me he was a big rap guy in Brooklyn or something. He was people down here. You know, they think, okay, he said he was a big rap guy in Brooklyn, you know. They're calling and they say, well, he's, he says he's going to go back to New York and he's just going to go over I-95 and, you know, hitchhike back up to New York. And like, okay, let him go. Let him go. <laughs> anyway, he did not do that. <laughs> Things went on from there and that's 2008 and there's just been so many ups and downs, zigs and zags, back and forth. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Dave on the phone the other night, you know, because I come down and there would be all these kind of crisis management situations, you know, one thing or another. I mean, up as really, I mean, really were up and down and stuff. Had a lot of anxiety about learning to drive for one 
anything. Well, I know Anne Marie really, you know, kind of cuts in on that. And I don't know, finally he did get his driver's license. And, you know, and he had some money that his grandfather had left for him, so I had no, you know, substantial way to buy a used car, so he bought a Ford Fusion down in North Miami. And, uh, anyway, he got the car. And, uh, came back down on a subsequent trip and we were going to go down to the basketball game to see that he played. I think LeBron James was on the table. So anyway, so we picked him up from where he was and I was driving because he, he wasn't quite that, you know, I didn't think he was skilled enough or something. So we got gas or we stopped to get cigarettes or something. And he didn't like the, the way I maneuvered his car around the <laughs> parking lot of the gas station or something like that. It's okay, Dad, get, you know, Get, get over here, I'm driving, so, <coughs> okay, whatever, you know, so, anyway, he zoomed down 95, we went to the game, it was like, you know, all this, you know, traffic and stuff, and you were sitting there, or after the game, and you were just inching along, and, you know, it was just, it, you know, it just progressed so much on that one thing, I mean, there's a lot of other things, but, uh, you know, I mean, there was always hope, and I never gave up on him. I'm Jan. I'm Bob's sister. I was the fun aunt in Oklahoma with the lake house and the old golf cart that drove and I always made him all the bacon and he could eat. <laughs> and brownies, I let him eat raw brownie, but, you know, as I was cooking it, bathroom, Judy would always go, you know those eggs might have salmonella and I'm like, it's okay. Oh, okay. Um, I've been with Paul the last couple of years just meeting him on vacation and then he really comes back and stay with us for a week or so. Like Bob said, we were always so hopeful, so hopeful. And uh, I really appreciate all your stories. It does really help. <coughs> and I know probably most of your families have struggled too. And it really does help to share. And thank you all so much. So obviously to the God of your understanding, um, dear God, as we sit here and remember your son, Paul, we ask that you wrap your arms around him as you welcome him into your home. We pray for your comfort that it will rain down from heaven. As the poet wrote, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path, my lying down, and, my, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it. You surround me on all sides. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is above me. There is nowhere I can hide from you. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wrong way in me, and lead me to the way of everlasting. Dear God, we lift Bob and Judy and the whole family up to you. We ask that you would also bring comfort and peace to them, knowing Paul is safe with you. We thank you for allowing all of us the time we had with him. We bless so many of us. And we are blessed to have known him. We commit him to your eternal rest. Amen. Amen. Can you read something from Paul's sister that she wanted to have read? I will say nothing, but I told you so. I only knows the price we have to pay. If I could tell you, I would let you know. If we should weep when clowns put on their show, if we should stumble when musicians play, time will say nothing but I told you so. There are no fortunes to be told, although, because I love you more than I can say, if I could tell you, I would let you know. The winds must come from somewhere when they blow. There must be reason why the leaves decay. Time will say nothing but I told you so. Perhaps the roses really want to grow. The vision seriously intends to stay. If I could tell you, I would let you know. 
Suppose the lions all get up and go, and the brooks and soldiers run away. Will time say nothing, but I told you so? If I could tell you, I would let you know. This is from Paul's sister. Dear Paul, I chose this poem to send off with you, but I am not entirely sure why. I think in part because I think it's beautiful, and I like the idea of sending beautiful things with you. It is fittingly Egyptian. You would like that. <laughs> I think I chose it too because it is made of questions rather than certainty. And my favorite parts of you were the parts that were filled with questions, infinitely curious. But the questions here are not the happily curious kind. They are the kind that say, they will have no answers ever. They are longing to know, but not a way of knowing. And I can't feel yet, it's too soon, or this is too sad, or too much the wrong thing, that I know what your death means. I can't feel or can't believe that your life has ended, and all that will ever happen to you has now already happened. It is hard to write you something from that feeling or not feeling. I keep waiting for more to happen, for a sense, for a sense-making thing to happen. So I will just tell you what I would have told you if you were still alive. That I love you, and am proud of you. I am angry at you, but that is fine, and not so important, really. That your life was made up of many different things, and none of them were, or is, the final thing that gets to say what all the other things mean. Though I hope something feels closed after some time, that your dying means something final and solid and peaceful to me and to you and to our family. I will always hold the space of your life open in that way. I will remember how much it contained, how various and beautiful you were, just like anyone. <coughs> I will, that is, remember and love your whole self, even the parts I never knew or never understood. I wish you had more time. I wish you had met Thea. I wish I had seen you more recently. I wish I could have known a better way to help you. I wish this all had been very different. But it wasn't, and it isn't. So, I love you. I will always love you. I will love your, our parents twice as much for the both of us. I love you, Alexander.
will smog turn to a friendship, a friendship turn to a bond, and that bond will never be broken, and love will never get lost. Thank you.